Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, title of the talk is Characterization of Impacts to Desert Pollinators from Utility Scale Solar. This is a consortium um, of colleagues from uh, all over uh, the country who are bee experts. And I'm not going to repeat all the things I just said, but um, you can go to the next slide. And these are all the participants from all the way from Singapore to Cornell University and all over campus here. And uh, we'll talk about that if we have time later. Next slide. This slide is important just to show you how extensive the development of ground mounted utility scale solar is across the United States. The size of the circles uh, are showing you how large the um, projects are, the smaller, the smaller the development. And this, so this is across the United States. You can see California, Oregon, and Washington here in the Western United States. It's particularly large in the warmer areas, of course, uh, where there's a lot of sun all the time in Nevada, Arizona, um, and Utah as well. But it's also going on on, in, on the East Coast as well. Next slide. So just to focus in here more in the Western United States, on the left-hand side is uh, Oregon and Washington. And again, uh, the larger the circle, the larger the um, proposed development. So red uh, denotes under construction uh, and the orange is under development. So it's not necessarily um, been approved yet, but those projects are under development. You can see how much is going on uh, relative to Oregon and Washington, how much is going on in California, Nevada and Arizona, uh, where there's um, particularly in the Central Valley and the desert regions because of the amount of sun going on. Next slide, please. One thing uh, that stands out though, um, when you hear other talks about um, whether it's plants or insects, and we talk about conservation, and the threats facing um, us from different um, landscape changes. There is a marked difference between what's happening on the west coast of the United States and the east coast. And you could, from the, these maps, um, th they show you the difference. The east coast of the United States has been developed um, and so there's very little public lands left. Um, and that most of these lands private ownership now. And you can see you can see the little key here, but this kind of bluish gray here is a Bureau of Land Management. And then um, this kind of maroon color is National Park Service down at the bottom. And up next in this kind of okra colors the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, the next up is Forestry Service. And then this kind of blackish blue is uh, Department of Defense. So most of the land on the East Coast is in private ownership now. Um, so it's already uh, either been developed or it's in commercial um, holdings uh, from corporations. Now go over to the West Coast where we all are in, um, in this part of the country. A lot of land is still held by um, the federal government, by the Bureau of Land Management. You can see here in Nevada, the Bureau of Land Management owns most of Nevada still, or uh, the Department of Defense. They have big, um, uh, you know, fields, um, military bases here, or by um, National Park Service in this maroon. And also you can see that up here in Washington state as well, or fish, uh, the uh, forestry service here up in Washington runs right through sort of this part of uh, Washington. And also you can see that in Oregon and also in California as well. So a lot of land is still held by the federal government. 
And so that really matters in how you're going to strategize your conservation efforts and what you can do in terms of um, developing your strategy to conserve uh, biodiversity. Oops. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry, I was pushing buttons thinking I can change the slides. Okay, so let's focus in on Washington and look at where your protected areas are. And you can see um, these large red areas here are um, uh, areas of protection. And also you can see your forestry um, service areas. So I put these arrows in to show you where there are uh, uh, projects for uh, developing um, uh, solar uh, projects. And the green arrows are areas where there are already uh, operating solar projects here. So just to take a look at that compared to where your greenscapes are in protected areas. Next slide, please. And this is a map um, where these projects actually are. And you just, there are tiny little circles here. And the, the green are the completed projects. There's one right here um, towards the center, another one here. And there's um, this orange, these orange circles are under construction. And then there's 16 uh, projects that are proposed right now today. Um, and um, right here is we have um, 4,892 acres that they comprise. Next slide, please. So for the project that we did um, in California, uh, California, which was funded by the Bureau of Land Management, they asked us to look at these um, ground mounted solar sites that were already built and tell us what kind of, tell them what kind of a diversity um, bee diversity, pollinated diversity was um, at these sites and perhaps uh, give them a baseline. So we developed a strategy to look at the baseline of species that are present and develop some um, maps and look at some archival data. So we collected that data on presence and abundance of the species, that's number two the space for time trade using disturbed sites and the matched, a matched control sites to compare the disturbed and a control site outside these solar sites. And we tried to replicate that design by doing looking at several sites, not just one. Next slide, please. Next slide. Great, thank you. Okay, so we, we had transects that looked at the, um, capture rate inside the solar facility at, and that was the minus um, 200 meters inside the facility at the fence line or boundary line, and then 200 meters outside the solar facility, 500 meters from the solar facility, and 2000 meters away from the solar facility. And each transect was 200 meters long and had a combination of the stars are blue vein traps, which capture bees and these little bowl traps that had soap and water in them. And we can talk about that later if you have questions about them. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, this is what the uh, facilities look like. This is a, a photovoltaic a facility. It's called Desert Sunlight solar and it's um, a PV site, so photovoltaic. This is Genesis and these, were, these sites were all along I-10 in California, the Southern Deserts, which actually represent what we call Western uh, Sonoran Deserts, a combination of Mojave and, and uh, Sonoran Desert. And this is what we call concentrated solar. So it's a trough, a mirrored panel that has a, um, a tube running in the middle that's a hot liquid. And it's very different from a, just a PV panel, a photovoltaic panel. Um, and uh, we'll talk about this other technology in the next slide. This is what the desert looks like on a, in a drought year. So April, 2016 was a drought year after five drought years, there was almost no annual plant out. Hobby Desert looks like um, in a wonderful year with lots of annuals, like in 2008, 
and 2009, where there was abundant annual bloom. It's fantastic. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, this is just what the transects look like. If you look at the um, GPS coordinates from uh, aerial view, so they're just lined up right next uh, at the right meters away from the solar project. Um, so we did a solar project called McCoy Solar, Desert Sunlight, Genesis. Uh, Quartzite was a site that's proposed, so it's completely unnerved. And then Ivanpah State Line, Soda Mountain, Copper Mountain, Silver State, are in the Northern Mojave and um, most of them are PV sites, except for Ivanpah, which is what they call con um, concentrated solar, but a tower. And right here is what these look like um, when you're driving down I-15 towards Las Vegas. Very different technology. The air temperature supposedly gets to be 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. And supposedly birds flying over that area will actually burst into flames. That's how hot it gets. Uh, insects also will be incinerated. So a very different technology. Now, Ivanpah is the only technology like that in um, California so far. But again, the, all these um, sites are on Bureau of Land Management land. So all on federal land, they're all leased for a long number of years, maybe 50 years to 100 years, and they're leased and the BLM gets rental um, monetary compensation for that. Next slide, please. This is what a blue vein trap looks like. And this tiny little yellow thing on the ground is what a little colored bowl trap looks like. It just has soapy water. This is also either filled with soapy water on the bottom or propylene glycol. Um, Non-toxic, both substances, the uh, bees fly into, they're attracted to this blue color. These are colored also. And then they fall in and get trapped inside. And they're just usually left out for the day and then collected at the end of the day. Next slide, please. These are some, just a, a quick slide of some of the different kinds of bees um, that are collected in the desert regions. There's, right now we have named 1600 species of bees just in California. We think there's many, many more. In our 2016 um, inventory in the, along the I-10, we found um, five new uh, spe species um, that are undescribed um, to science. Um, and that was just in five days of collection events, five days, and in a drought year after five drought years. Um, and I can name all these uh, bees for you. This is Centris uh, rhodopis. Mega Kylie, which is the slide I had in the beginning um, slide for the uh, PowerPoint, Hapropoda pallida, Calliopsis puelli, and Thaffer urbana, you could probably see um, in anybody's backyard um, or any open space. It's a very uh, ubiquitous bee. And Lazio blossom, Centris agapostum in Texana, Dita. It's one of the smallest bees. There's 700 species of this genus. Next slide, please. For people who are not familiar with native solitary bees, everybody always thinks about honeybees, which are social. 80% of the bees in the world are solitary bees. And so most of them emerge in spring or they can emerge in summertime, but they're solitary, meaning they never overlap with their um, uh, offspring. The, the reproductive uh, adult never overlaps with her offspring from the next year. And so the adults emerge in the spring, they mate, the female digs a nest and provisions it and lays, lays an egg and then she dies. And then they develop and underground nests and as larvae feeding on this provision, and they get larger and larger feeding on this provision over the months, 11 months, and then they pupate and they turn into an adult waiting still underground until the next spring, females long gone, the adults, 
next year they emerge and start that process all over again. The important point is that landscape where they're developing underground is still important and the depth of that landscape and the hydrology of that landscape is still very important that it's not disturbed or um, the hydrology is not changed. Next slide, please. So when we, we found 113 species in that drought year, as I mentioned, five undescribed species. And when we analyzed which are, how many were specialist bees on a particular group of plants, um, different um, families or different genera, we found about 42.5% were specialists, about 10%, 10.6% were uh, polylectic or uh, generalists. Um, in their floral habits. 8.8% were parasitic, meaning they were kleptoparasites on other bees' provisions. About 30% were completely unknown in terms of their floral habits. But what we do know is about 75% or maybe a little bit more are ground nesting. And that's been reinforced with other people's research over the years. So most bees, most solitary bees are ground nesting bees. And the other 20% or so are cavity nesting bees. So, and that agrees with other research down in the Mojave Desert, Clark County that was done in 2004, 2005 by Griswold and friends. And I worked on that study. So again, these figures agree with earlier research. Next slide, please. I don't have to, this is detail about the families of bees, but as you can see, just from this graph, it's very evident. There's all these different families of bees from andrenids and apids, which is honeybees are in the apids and anthophora bees and centrist bees. Almost all of these are ground nesting bees until you get to this one family of bees, which are megachilids. And these are the bees that carry their pollen on their stomachs, on their bellies. And sometimes you, if you're observing in your garden, you'll actually see a bee with uh, pollen on their belly. And these are the cavity nesting bees. And that's the only slide. <laughs> now you can go to the next slide. Okay, our results. So are solar facilities affecting native bees in the deserts? Well, so this slide um, shows, this is about abundance and distance from the solar uh, boundaries. So inside, you can see this is the inside transect right here. And this is at the boundary, the zero uh, meter, um, uh, transect right here. And you can see a big jump right at the boundary here. So yes, inside the solar projects has lower abundance of bees than the boundary line and just outside. So yes, we have a significant difference between inside the solar projects than when you get to the boundary line. So that's what this shows, this slide shows, and it is significant. We'll go to the next, next slide, please. And also in, oops, this slide, um, we have a, a, also a similar um, difference right at the boundary line here, which is zero, the zero meters. And again, there's a jump in the Shannon diversity. And this is about also the distance from, this, um, from the solar facility. You have a little bit lower here, and then you have a jump right at the boundary line. Next slide. Now this slide, we threw in this quartz site, um, which is undisturbed. This is an area that's um, proposed for a new solar facility. There is um, some variability. This is dead sunlight and Genesis and McCoy, but you do see a jump. This is not a control site. It's not considered a match control site, but you can see there is a significant difference um, in insect richness at this completely undisturbed site. Next slide, please. Again, richness, um, 
there's there's definitely a jump at the zero fence line boundary uh, for species richness. Next slide, please. Okay. And again, if we go richness by site, this is desert sunlight, Genesis, McCoy. Again, you see a big jump at quartzite, which is completely undisturbed. And there's a significance here, um, which is, is worrisome, <laughs> a little worrisome. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, a little, another click. Okay, this is about community composition. Oop, a little back up. Community composition, we looked at all the transects and pulled them all together to look at the community composition of species in all these different transects um, pulled together. And it looks like they're overlapping. So the species um, that are composing all these different transects looks like they're very similar when they're all pulled together. Um, and so they all overlap. That's what this um, type of analysis looks at. Next, next click. But if we look at the and separate out the different solar sites um, from each other and their transects, they start to separate out. So the community, the species communities are different. So McCoy is different from Desert Sunlight and Genesis, which overlap somewhat. And they're all different from Quartzite. Quartzite actually is across the highway, the I-10 highway which starts to talk to the heterogeneity of the death. So it's not all the same, you know? So if you walk a thousand uh, meters or 2000 meters, it may be different. You're not getting the same species composition. Um, Desert sunlight is actually the closest to Joshua Tree National Park. And, um, we have uh, bees from Joshua Tree National Park that haven't been analyzed yet. It will be interesting to see how that matches up. Next, next slide, please. As part of this study, we mapped the distribution of the species we were finding in the, at these sites. And we did a whole bunch of uh, species distributions, which would, had never been done before. And you can see all these bees are focused down in the, the deserts. And um, so, bye, bye, Caitlin. Sorry for the glitch. Um, so, um, so these are not bee species that are found just anywhere. There are a couple of species that are ubiquitous like Anthopter urbana, but most of these species are desert adapted species. And this, these are the only places that they're found. Next slide, please. And this is all the dots from the 19th that we use in some of our um, climate analysis. Next slide, please. And when we did the analysis of predicted presence of where the hot spots of diversity for um, California and the um, deserts were, this is what we found was here is the biodiversity for um, these warmer areas are right down here. And you can see Los Angeles is San Francisco right here. This is Phoenix down here and Tucson. So, and all these areas have not necessarily been sampled um, because humans tend to sample along roads or places that there are services and places like that. But this is from using a model that we plug in uh, climactic data and the GPS um, coordinates from these bees that have been sampled. Next slide, please. And what it turned out to be that the annual mean temperature and the mean temperature of the warmest month and the precipitation of the driest um, month were the most important um, parameters or variables that predicted where um, the highest diversity of the diversity would be. Next slide. Along these roads is where bees are collected. <laughs> Not necessarily, they don't get everywhere in this area. Next slide, please. 
This is where the developed or urban areas are. Next slide. You can show the Central Valley. There's almost nothing left in the Central Valley because it's almost all agriculture now. And right down here, I'm pointing with my finger, it doesn't, right down here is the Imperial Valley, which is agriculture here. This is the urban developed areas in the brown. Um, next slide, uh, next click, I should say. This is the transmission lines here. Next click. These are the protected areas. So this is the Mojave National Preserve. This is Joshua Tree here. And um, this is, I believe, a military base here. But these green areas are protected areas. Next click. These are where the solar sites that we worked on for this study. And this is Ivanpah up here. And you can see the Central Valley where that's almost all agriculture now. There used to be a part of a desert here, the San Joaquin Desert. It's almost all gone though. And next click. Again, you see, this is a solar development, solar development here where the red dots are. And you can see this is, um, uh, Death Valley. This is Death Valley right here. This is Mojave and this is Joshua Tree right here. Okay, next slide. And again, now you start to see all the development of utility scale solar in chaparral, deserts, and all over. Okay, next slide. Okay, what's the significance? The richness and abundance inside solar project boundaries are significantly lower than outside the solar projects. Uh, we'll click there. Historical archival um, data, both spatial and temp temporal, was used, can be used to document presence and absence. So we looked at the museums to see what used to be there and uh, also along with the newly collected data. So there were species um, maybe 60 species that we did not find that was in the museums that could have been there, was there in the past. We don't know if it wasn't there because it was a significantly drought year or if it's just no longer there. Um, and uh, we recommend that it's advisable to do a baseline before construction is started. So we know what's there before any disturbance um, is done. And, uh, well, I haven't changed that. It's actually 113 species uh, because uh, a species has already been described now in the time between 2016 and 2022. Okay, next uh, click. This is a slide that I wanted to show you that has to do with climate change because everything's getting drier uh, and warmer. This is from Costa Rica from Daniel Jansen and his um, group <coughs> goes back to the same sites and collects. And this is not just monarch butterflies. He collects every type of butterfly from the most common cabbage butterfly to everything else. Um, for monarch butterflies, there's been a 97% decline in the Western monarch butterfly, but um, other butterflies have declined as well, just species richness. Um, 35 years of data, so 159 species have declined, which they attribute to habitat loss, climate change, and neonicotinoid um, pesticides. Next. So they call it death by a thousand cuts. So climate change, habitat loss, agrochemicals, also light pollution. Next slide. Um, maybe I don't have time because we had such a delay. Uh, there's a big difference between distributed power and utility scale power. And so we can still do solar. It doesn't have to be this utility large scale ground mounted solar. It can be on people's roofs and it can improve the efficiency and local and avoid transmission distributed losses. Click and click. Um, and there's many advantages to, to that, um, click. And there's um, security, there's a security value to that um, in terms of uh, when there's large storms and other sorts of um, 
catastrophic events, click, uh, in terms of the grid and disruption from attack, click. Uh, and it, it's better from a defensive um, standpoint, click. And it can supplement the power grid at peak times to reduce blackouts and brownouts, click. And then there's the issue of net metering for electric cu customers. So you can generate your own electricity and it can flow to the electricity grid. And um, when you exceed your customer use, you can flow that to the grid offsetting electricity consumed by other customers. Next slide. I think I've already discussed that. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, that's sort of redundant. On to the next slide. So what can we do? Support distributed solar. This is a big issue because across the United States, big energy is fighting distributed power legislatively in every single way. So you can support uh, distributed power um, on your roofs, on corporate roofs, on parking lots, everywhere. So that's very important. Um, next click. Um, use motion detector lights. So reduce light pollution. That's very important and saves energy. Next click. Um, be mindful of carbon footprints. We're doing a video presentation, so that's very good. Next click. Um, support protected areas such as national, state, county, city parks, reserves. I'm sure you already do that. And uh, convert lawns to native plants. You guys already know that. Support nonprofits doing the good work to protect, expand ecosystem protection. Human health and ecosystem helps are one in the same. You can't have one without the other. Um, we started our nonprofit 30 years ago. So work on converting corporate behavior to green equitable behavior in the US and abroad. Next, click. Support science education, go out in the wild, take kids out. They don't have to be your kids. Take anybody, anybody's kids out. Vote, vote, vote. Very important, everybody knows that. Next, click. put down the insecticides. I know you guys, they're plant people, but really insecticides, you don't need them. You really don't. And plant species that all wildlife to can use. I'm not just a bee person. I'm not just a butterfly person. I'm an ecosystem person. So, um, you know, all insects are good. Um, you know, maybe one or two, you know, the introduced species are a problem. They definitely are a problem. But be an advocate for, for insects because insects and plants, they're, they're married together. So, and thank you very much. Um, Click one more slide. And we had lots of funders. We had BLM, Community Foundation, Disney also uh, funded some uh, work. And of course, the UC uh, Davis Department of Entomology. I'll take any questions if anybody's still here. <laughs> oh, no, go back. We don't have to have that. Thanks. OK. I'll take any questions. Everybody left? <laughs> I'm here. I'm ready to read a question for you, Leslie. Uh, we have one from Kathy. And she's asking, from what I saw, the areas in which these projects occur have been bladed. The bees have the same issue as desert tortoises, loss of habitat. So isn't the issue of consolidated power generation more of a management one now? That is how to install the large operations and retain as much of the existing vegetation. Um, yeah, the projects occur have been bladed. Yeah, yeah, they do have the same issues as desert tortoises, uh, loss of habitat. Um, well, yeah, well, certainly during construction they. Well, first of all, they they you know plow the area, so they're they've ex they're pulling up the crust of the soil, and particularly in the desert, 
once you remove the crust, you've removed a lot of what's really important in the desert crust. And um, the nutrients and the sort of the um, complex network of that desert soil, which is so important for the plants that live in the desert. It's so once you've disrupted that, that's, that's a lot of damage. A lot of damage is very hard to repair. Um, and you've also opened it up for invasive plants too. And you've created a lot of dust, which is not great. Um, and you know, you, you've opened it up for all these invasive weeds to come in. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a great problem for the desert uh, tortoises. And the desert tortoises eats native plants and those native plants need um, native bees to pollinate those plants. And most of those bees are uh, nesting in the soil. Some of those bees nest fairly shallow, shallowly in that soil. And if you diss those areas, uh, whether those bees are gonna come back, um, they also like leveling some of the areas. And um, a lot of bees, not all of them, but some of the bees like a slope and they nest in um, sort of by an, in the washes and the solar sites don't really like washes <laughs> and they don't like water because they don't like them near their panels and their electrical, their underground electrical. And, you know, these are acres and acres, you know, thousand acres, depending on the size of it. You know, those, they'll get in a, a solar uh, facility that's like 3,000 acres, but then they'll build another one right next to it. There's another 3,000 acres and then another one. And then it gets larger and larger. And then all of a sudden you have this huge fragmentation of this landscape. And that's, that's what the problem is. They're fragmented, the huge landscape, which is a, not a great thing which we already know. We've known that for decades and decades of research that fragmentation of landscape is not a good thing for species. This is amazing. I had no idea that it was so important to break this up. Uh, we have another question for you uh, from Gabby. She wrote, I help out with the Fridays for Future US group, a climate organization, and I would love to get your advice on what and how we promote renewable energy that is best for native bees and other insects? Yeah, um, well, certainly when they're planning a project, they should really, um, Rebecca Hernandez and uh, our group produced a paper, I wanna say, what year was that? Maybe in 2015, going down all the things that they should be considering before they choose a site transmissibility loss uh, is, and they tend to put it far away from where the users are gonna be. Um, but we would like them to be think about putting it close to urban centers um, where it's gonna be used. Um, that would be better. Or, and air, put it on land that's already been disturbed and disrupted already, like old mm -hmm. ag land and things like that. That, that would be great if they did that um, or before they lost even, on the weekend yeah. right yeah before they even look at <laughs> undisturbed pristine nature why look at this land the um, controls all this beautiful wildlands and um somebody thought that was a good idea to put it on pristine native wildlands with native plants and native wildlife and um we thought it was a bad idea from the get-go, but we could not get them to move off that. You know, mm -hmm. How much, um, because, you know, people who are lawyers and businessmen, they, they didn't go to school for biology. So on paper, it looked like a good deal. Um, and it looked like green, but it's not green, you know? So that's why we'd like them to look at sites that have been quarried or sites that have been already desalinated, you know, and you know, used, you know, and there's so much land like that, we think. Right, right, totally makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Kelsey. Uh, are these facilities using pesticides to control vegetation that grows in the areas between the solar panels? That's an excellent question. Almost no one ever asked me that. For Kelsey? Yeah, you know, we were initially told that no, they're, they're not allowed to use herbicides. And, um, but I, when I was working out there, they do use herbicides, pesticides, yeah, sure. How else would they control it? All the weeds that are coming up. 
because they don't want those big weeds going under their panels, right? So um, sometimes they use like mowing or weed whacking, but they, it's the easiest thing for them to do is use herbicides, you know? We were told by the bees don't, and then I was out there, you know, for uh, a couple of years, and of course they did. You know, the guys at the facilities told me they did. So, um, yeah, I don't know what to say, you know. Yeah, it's they, just the easy thing. They, the BLM told me, I said, well, was that written into their lease? And they said, mm, you know, they kind of, they, you know, they just saw money coming in to offset their budget. And if I told you how much they pay, it's ridiculous. You know, you and I, we all could have gotten together and bought that land or, you know, lease that land ourselves. Um, yeah, wow. that's a problem because, yeah, yeah, they do. All right, next question, they're really rolling in uh, from Lori. Does water from solar panel auto wash affect vegetation? Well, that's also a great question. Um, they have wells that they've dug um, and uh, at the sites because they obviously need to wash the panels. And um, they have all sorts of calculations about how the amount of water they're gonna use is not gonna be a big deal. And, um, and some of them say that they bring water in, um, but they have to clean the panels. Yeah, because it's really dusty out there, right? They've created their own dust. Um, and it's, it's windy and dusty in the desert anyway, you know, depending on where it is. Boy, if you go up along the I-15, if you've ever gone to Vegas, um, if you drive, it's like by Prim and man, they get some serious dust up there. And the more construction they do, the more dust there is in the air. Yeah. So the more they break up the crust of the desert, the worse it is. Um, so yeah. Um, what does that do? Um, I don't think there have been, uh, there has been research to see what is that drip off the panels do and how is that affecting the plants and does that affect the germination of plants? Does that increase the germination? Um, and one of our colleagues said that, um, you know, there's seeds and native plants do germinate under that. Um, drip. I don't know if it's any better, but they, they do germinate there. There is a shade. There's shade cast, of course, from the panels, the PV panels. Um, the studies haven't been done to see if bees will actually go to, mm. under the panels because native bees don't like shade. That's, that's why there's so much diversity in deserts. They, most native bees um, like open ground and they don't that's why you find more diversity in deserts rather than in deep forests, say, or redwood. Oh. So putting all that shade cover, um, and nobody's actually looked at that. And mm -hmm. um, if I had a little bit more time, I'd look at that. I'd do some planting under PV or on different simulated panels to see what kind of visitation rate those plants would get versus being out in the open. But nobody actually has looked at that. Um, right, what, right how it affects nesting sites. Um, check that in the wash, because they're, they are removing a, a lot of uh, what we call refugia species in these areas that they're putting the solar sites in, like mesquite, um, which grows in the washes. So they'll take out all those wash areas in that area. They just bulldoze that, that whole area. Um, yeah, so, you know, it, on a more what positive we, note, we have someone here asking for your advice on their own land. You were just talking about, you know, pulling together and buying land. So here's someone wants to ask you, uh, uh, I live in Southeast Washington. We are planning to build a home on 1.7 acres in rural Walla Walla in a couple of years. Should we, should we be planting vegetation on the vacant dirt lot now to encourage a baseline population of bees so we can plan ecologically for our later build? What vegetation should we consider? Clover. We also plan on solar panels as part of the home design. She, God, I love looking that for your area. consulting. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Walla Walla. Um, I was working on a, a ground nesting out there. Um, 
And well, I would plant, um, you know, and you know, actually there's a great um, list that my friend Jim Kane, James Kane, who works up in Utah, and he put a desert uh, species list together. I could probably send you exactly, exactly. So you have to modify it for, for Washington, but, um, and, uh, but you wanna leave some space for, uh, that's bare for some nesting. Um, and uh, Nomia is native and it's native to that area. Um, and it's a wonderful bee, a beautiful bee. Um, but there's other bees, there's a lot of, um, this is not native, but there's lavender farms out there. And uh, I know when we went, I had some spare time. I just went to the lavender. They did go to the lavender farms just because they were, it was outside the ag area. So, uh, and a lot of them were going to the lavender, but um, there's just so many, you could have just a wonderful, wonderful garden because the native bees out there are wonderful. And you don't tend to see as much in the uh, ag planted areas, but um, right. yeah, I, oh gosh, yeah. Um, I could probably send you some books, uh, a book and uh, Jim Kane's links to flowers um, rather than taking the time right now. Oh. Yeah, but we would love to publish something on our website with these lists and yeah, the extra resources. That'd be great. That'd yeah, because <laughs> Jim has done a lot of work in Walla Walla as well. We meet there to, to do that out in that area. And um, yeah, it's a great diversity out there. We could do a fabulous um, wildlife garden and uh, have, and that's a good amount of land. Yeah. So you could do a little, some like, kind of uh, dry bank and um, yes, Nomia actually will nest on, um, it likes salted ground. So you put some salt on the ground, but it, it has to be moist uh, mm. early on the season. Uh, we could talk, I could talk <laughs> about that. All right, we have another question. Hello, Dr. Gershens. How much of an impact does the reduction of native bees have on the local native plant population? Are there fewer desert blooms because of this? How would you conduct that study if you haven't already? You know, that's, that's a hard question to, it's a good question, but it's a hard question to get at. It's the opposite, yeah. What we do is we, it's one of the things, we just got a grant in California to look at the biodiversity in California, bees included. And um, one of the things we look at is our archival data, which of course was never enough because you know we never had enough resources to look at everything in California to do full uh, inventory. But we look at what was there and what's there now um, to go back um, to see if we're missing species, if species have been lost. Um, but the deserts in particular, the, the weather is so variable in terms of precipitation, um, the climate, I should say. And so when you're in drought years, bees have the ability to stay below in their nests and not emerge in those drought years, even if it's 10 years. And then when the precipitation is good, out they come. So you don't know wow. if, you know, if they're gone or if it's just a bad year and they're waiting. And wow. so you see a good year and then, oh, there they are. They've mm -hmm. come out. And so they're still there. So it would take a lot of lifetimes perhaps um, to know if they're, they're really gone. And um, the plants, you know, the seeds are the same. They'll sit in the soil for many, many years and they're still wow. growing. And then they come out. So the deserts are very hard to know if they've been damaged. Um, mm. And uh, so that's why you need these long, long-term studies to see, um, which is one of the reasons why it's worrisome because they're doing this large scale, what I call damage um, to these by fragmenting uh, the desert, these desert areas. And we won't see the, the result of that for many generations and then it'll be too late, it'll be too yeah. late. just yeah. like in the rainforest you know right you right see it. it's gone yeah. yeah i just wanted to share something from our earlier before the presentation conversation you were you were talking about how 
the desert has good years, just like a wine does. And you were talking about, was it 2009? That was a wonderful year for uh, moisture and, and water in the desert. So maybe we have another 10 year cycle coming up, right? Yeah, we might have a really good year this year because we had you know a few really bad drought years, um, fires and all that, but it has right. rained rather well so far. And uh, we're just like amazed here down in Northern California, I have been watching the rains in the desert and they have gotten rain, you know, in Palm Springs and Baker, California, you know, we look at all the little towns and Vegas has gotten rain. And so we're, I'm very encouraged that sometimes it takes two years for it to, you know, wake up. But um, so that's encouraging if it continues through January and February, that's very optimistic uh, for a good year. And, um, you know, and all the botany people start going out in, you know, February looking for wildflowers and they do post pictures. So we'll know, we should know pretty soon um, how it's going. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna cut it off after the sixth question. So just if we could spend maybe a minute on each of these questions to get these excited uh, attendees uh, answered. Uh, we have from Pamela, my yard is very disturbed. Are there soil websites specifically for the Pacific Northwest for advice on restoring the soil so our ground nesters will benefit? Ah, well the ground nesters, well, depends, you know, Robin Thorpe, who is a great, great master bee person, um, who just passed away two years ago, he's at Davis, you know, he really believed if you plant the plants, the bees will come, you know, um, and some of the species are adaptable, they, you know, each species has its own depth that they'll dig to, so they, um, so the plants need, you know, the right soil and, you know, loam or whatever, but the bees, um, for each species, you know, some like slopes, some like flat, some like, most of them like bare ground, but there are a few that will nest like under a leaf or they're all a little different. I, there's a paper I'm working on, we're trying to get out and uh, we have all the, um, We'll have some of the soil depths, but Jim Kane, again, who's a great, you know, great bee person, he has a paper on soil depths of native bees, and it's like a fantastic paper. I can list that for you too. Oh, awesome! Yeah, I'm just going to address Sarah Bro. Uh, she said she'd love to see that list from you, and she wanted to thank you. Um, and then we have from Michael Lachlan. Do you think solar scorecards have much value? Solar scorecards? I'm not sure what that. Oh, I don't know if that's like carbon credits, but um, oh, oh. I'm, I'm just taking a guess, Michael. I'm not um, sure either. I'm not sure what that is, it, um, mean from companies or, uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure what that is, but um, I, I'm not sure, but uh, okay. uh, well, so I don't want to answer it and us. answer it incorrectly, but um, I mean, I, I think getting solar on your roof would be great. Uh, you have to do homework to find the right company to get the right, you don't, you don't want to get company that's about to go out of business. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, from Will Peterson, uh, have there been any similar studies on solar farms using regenerative energy practices, solar farms coupled with regenerative agriculture? Regen well, they, there have been papers on coupling solar farms with agriculture with solar farms. And um, a lot of, some of those papers I have reviewed some papers on, and in England in particular, um, that's there's a real push for that. Uh, they they've, they've coupled some of those studies with uh, honeybees, particularly in England. Um, honeybees are not native bees. It's not that they're bad, but um, uh, it's particularly popular because they use um, honeybees for pollination for a lot of crops. That's why they're using. Uh, honeybees. Um, I, uh, to me, I'd, I'd probably lean a little bit more towards native bees. 
it depends what kind of um, cropping system you have. Um, if you're doing apple orchards or, you know, what, what the agriculture is. But in Europe, they're doing a lot of um, cropping for um, brassica, um, what they call rape. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. so it, it really depends. But yeah, I have uh, seen a lot of uh, research for adding solar farms uh, using um, for agriculture areas and putting it in the areas that they can't really fit any more cropping in. So putting it in the corners right. and things like that. Um, yeah, I have seen some pushback in some rural areas that don't want to see uh, solar farms because of the, they don't want to turn their landscape into a mm -hmm. solar array. Right, right. So visually, um, it, it sort of depends on where it is. But uh, in Europe and England in particular, they're doing a lot of marrying of solar. But also, also back east in Michigan, they're doing solar married with agriculture too. Oh, uh, we have an answer from Michael real quick. Uh, he said that solar score scorecards are being used by states, including California, to evaluate a solar project or a whether it should be approved. Well, what are the, what are the uh, variables that they're evaluating? Uh, let me... Uh, Michael will have to get back to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have Gabby. Um, I am currently a wildlife biology sophomore at University of Montana. And my home is in Yakima. I think bees and butterflies and moths are really interesting. And I was wondering if you have any advice for possibly pursuing a career studying bees and butterflies and moths. Oh, well, you know, I have to tell you, bees are very strong now and all insects right now. I can't say there's been a more popular time for insects because uh, now we've figured out that insects are declining um, in abundance and uh, just all over the planet. Um, and now that everybody realizes that everything eats insects, I mean, everything, you know, 98% of the birds on earth eat insects. Um, mm -hmm. Even if they're seed eaters, they use insects when their uh, offspring are very young. And so wow. we've now figured out that insects are, are indeed very important. And, um, and bees, though I'm not sure everybody really still grasps at that 80% um, of the bees are ground nesting and um, the 20,000 species of bees out there are native bees. You know, they're not just, we're not just talking about honeybees. Um, and the, that, most bees are solitary. So that message still actually hasn't gotten out yet. Um, right. Most of the questions I get on the, on the street when I'm walking around are about honeybees. And so we still have a lot of them. So I think your mm -hmm. uh, chance of getting a job, uh, a career are, are better, much better than they used to be. Because um, uh, when I started, really was uh, not very many jobs, even um, today a job in um, tropical medicine, you know, and uh, epidemiology is very, very good, which has to do with insects, because insects are vectors, mosquitoes, flies, and things like that, vector diseases after our big pandemic, which we don't know when that's going to end. But, um, you know, I would have said 20 years ago, you couldn't have gotten a job doing vector biology either uh, mm -hmm. until today, right? Until two years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's changed quite a bit. I, I remember my professor, I wanted to study epidemiology and he said, forget it. You'll never get a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, just wait a little while, right? <laughs> um, here's a question from Mickey Chamis in the chat. I thought it was interesting. Do, roof, do home rooftop or top of barn solar panels cause harm to pollinators? Uh, on top of roofs or a barn? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I've not that I've heard. The concentrated solar, of those mirrored panels, um, uh, the aquatic beetles think they're bodies of water because they shine. Um, so they, mm. they look like a body of water. So you they fly. fly towards them and they're very hot. And, and those, those cause a problem. Um, but a PV panel, no, I don't think so. Now, in, in the depths, one of the things with agriculture, putting a PV panel and uh, honeybees next to it, I have had 
people call me and contact me and say, what can we do about this? Because as soon as honeybees leave the hive, the first thing they do is, is go to the bathroom. They poo. <laughs> hmm. And if they place them too close to the PV panels, of course they poo on the PV panels. And <laughs> the, the honeybee poo is actually pretty hard to get off of if you've ever had any near a car. Um, and I just tell them, well, don't put them near the panels, <laughs> you know, just poop. But, um, but yeah, so the, those, they're not harmful to the bees, but the bees can be harmful to the panels. Um, wow. Uh, yeah. So no, not, not as far as I know. No. Got it. All right. So uh, there, there are a few more, more comments. Do you feel like you're up for five more minutes or do you think you want to sure. call it? Sure. Huh? All right. I'm, I'm uh, your on the road uh, entomologist. You know, you don't get that opportunity that often. So, yeah. Uh, we have here, um, some, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, so Frank writes, the basic issue is the extra large footprint of solar power, hence solar's incompatibility with natural ranching or agricultural environments. Um, and he, he's right. It, I, I think you have opened up all our eyes to that. Like there, there's so much positive press out there about solar and helping the earth. And it's just not weighted with the other factors involved with the environment, right? Um, let's see what else we can. Um, SP wrote, mason bees are far more efficient at pollinating apple trees than honeybees. That's Very right. interesting for Washington state people to know. Um, Paul would like to know where you got your insects from behind you. So maybe Paul is a, a decorative insect person. It looks like you have a chain, a paper chain behind you of oh, insects. Yes, that was my holiday decoration. Yeah. You know, that was a present. So I didn't get that. Some uh, It was a gift. I honestly don't know where it came from, but isn't that unique? Some, uh, some a friend gave that to me. I didn't ask them where they got it from, but is I've never seen anything like that before. Um, it's rather unique. It's got flies and beetles and all kinds of things. Yes, thank you. I I can try and track them down to see where they got it. I've had it for quite a long time, and um, I, I, you know, people come to my house and they think so I get us kind of like ew <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> for the people who aren't entomologists, of course. But um, yeah, I, I honestly don't know where they got it, but thank you. I, I have insect collections also around the house somewhere. But uh, yeah, my house is uh, definitely is a little odd. The freezer is also very odd, I have to tell you. <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> uh, stacked with insects. Um, but yeah. Um, Sorry, well, I'd like I to give you an answer, but I honestly don't know. They may have even gotten it in Europe for all I right. know. Yeah. I have a quick question about, um, you, your maps were amazing, uh, the way you were detailing the, the large regions. And I was just curious, uh, you know, what kind of software do you use or, or what um, resources do you use for your map research? Oh, um, are you talking about the where the solar sites were? Or the... uh, it was. It was. The, there were some on solar sites, and those were just pinpoints. But there were other ones detailing um, uh, the biodiversity wow. by region. There were like heat maps, oh, and, yeah, yeah. and they were showing. Um, I didn't know if you created those yourself, or if you had. If you have a team at UC Davis that you work with, or. Yeah. Have minions. <laughs> yeah, we have minions. No, um, the heat map, uh, the green one with all the, the where the urban areas and ag areas is uh, was created from um, a model uh, that was built by a faculty member at UC Davis, and that that's a really a wonderful model, and um, where you put all these variables in of temperature and precipitation. Mm -hmm. And then you put your GPS stuff in. So that was done at uh, UC Davis. So we created that, but, um, uh, and then, uh, but we had to, you know, go get all our GPS points first right. back into right. that. Um, and then 
you know, you can add shape files to that too. We, we also did this other really, which I didn't have in the slideshow, of putting all the eco regions on maps and laying over our GPS points to, from another paper. So that one map, one paper that just came out on Ash Mediella used that eco region concept. And we've done maps like that. And I, I do like doing that now for some mm -hmm. of my research because it shows you where the species are, but it also shows you habitat types that they're, they're found in. And in the old days, they used to just show the um, counties, county lines. Right, right. It really doesn't show you anything uh, biological. You know, right. you know really, species don't care about county lines. <laughs> right. Know? It may help yeah. to show us, you know, what county is in, but uh, species don't care about that right, right. They, they care about an eco region and um so uh we've started to use those uh eco regions now in our yeah maps. I, I think both california and washington are famous for having all these eco these microclimates in their ecosystem and yeah. even my own house my backyard and front yard are completely different so <laughs> yeah. and you know if you work in any place for long enough you realize that the it can be different. You can go down the road for, you know, a hundred meters or so, and it's different. You know, the desert's famous for that. Here there's water underneath the ground, you know, it's being fed by an underground um, resource. You know, the Mojave River just all of a sudden goes underground. And all of a sudden there's plants, rich botanical um, diversity right here. And then you go across the road, there's nothing. <laughs> right. So it's, it's not uniform, it's very heterogeneous. And when we try to um, tell that to uh, people that work in the government, that um, you know, we don't want them to just obliterate this whole area because right. it's very hard to get that point across. Yeah. Um, so we're just gonna uh, catch up with Michael. Uh, again, he, he has a website. Uh, the, the website is for the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and that is where he's talking about. So if anybody is interested, just go to the Q&A, and I'll leave that up so you can click on it and see what he's talking about. And we have Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Uh, she's asking, do you know of anyone doing similar studies on pollinators near wind turbines in arid landscapes? Lots of wind farm developments are happening in eastern Washington. That's appropriate for Palm Springs, right? Yeah. Um, and oh, yeah. There's any input on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a big wind farm as you go across the I-10 as you're coming into Palm Springs, the giant. Uh, a line of wind turbines. Yeah, the wind turbines are, you bees don't fly that high. That's really high. They don't get up that high, but um, it's certainly a problem for birds. Right. And uh, he, a lot of people have studied that. Mm -hmm. Wow. It, well, that's fortunate for the bees. At yeah, least. but most bees won't fly that high. Um, right. Actually getting... <laughs> Yeah, there's an area in Walla Walla actually um, where they want to put a highway right over these bee beds where uh, that uh, pollinate the alfalfa. Nomi melandra is a much better pollinator of alfalfa for seed than honeybees are. And so the um, growers have, these are, it's a native bee, um, made all these bee beds and they've been there for 50 years or longer. And they want to put a road right through it. Way. And um, so the highway people said, well, we'll just put a fence up, you know, and the bees will fly over the fence. Well, the bees don't fly high. You can't put a fence up. They won't go fly up. They just don't do that. They're, they're, they fly pretty yeah. high. So, Aww. yeah. You'd have to make little tunnels or in the wall or something, I guess. Aww. Yeah. And you now they, if they, you put a highway up, they just all get hit by cars. Yeah. Um, just get killed on the highway. No, yeah. I, I, the dilemma, humans, you know, they, yeah. these animals, they don't know about speeding cars at 75. No, no. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our question and answer uh, session. Uh, is there anything you'd like to leave us with, Leslie? Uh-oh. 
you're concerned about bees and oh yeah the highway <laughs> yeah that was i know i because i was down and uh or up i should say in Walla Walla for several years doing research on nomi and melandri and i i did see some of that press and uh, the the growers up there really love their bees these bees they really love them they're like their you know other their offspring you know they care about them so much and uh um, and they take care of them. And it's, it's really heartwarming, it is. If you saw them, you'd all fall in love with them. They're very beautiful. And they don't, you know, they're aggregating nests. It's really something to see. It's almost like the, the monarch uh, overwintering sites. It's really something to see. I wish I could take you all there. Or oh, you, I wish you could too. There. You know, you should create some kind of touring experience because I'm not going to travel too far, you should have a tour of the bees in the desert. I'm sure you'd get a lot of people to come. I used to teach a class, a natural history of the Mojave Desert um, years ago, but then I got so busy doing research and uh, you know, so I don't do that as much, I don't really do it all anymore, but it was great fun. It's really great fun and we should do that. I was talking to my husband and I said, we should do that some more. Uh, he said, no, I'll retire. And, you know, entomologists tend not to retire. Just, just <laughs> well, so here's something you can go to. Uh, Kate just said there's a Washington Native Bee Society meeting on January 27th. Thank you, Kate. That's, that's good to that's know. That's amazing that you have a group up there. It's amazing. I, I don't think I've ever heard of a hyper local. Native a, that, it's like almost like being in England, you know? It's like, really, it's fantastic. I, I applaud you guys. <laughs> Thank you. And we applaud you too. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed this. Sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning. I'm so sorry. As Don't well. be sorry. No, it's, it's just, it's just life. It's whatever it is. So blame it on the pandemic. <laughs> but that's great. And I'll have an extra set of procedures I have to go through next time. <laughs> Just yeah, to double should, check. We should test it before instead of the. I know, but you know, when things work 99% of the time, you're like, oh, let's talk instead. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, all attendees. Thank you for waiting. I hope you enjoyed this. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.